Next chapter. Let's start a new chapter for Christmas. Um, now, the employees are hired, they get some compensation, they get some benefits. And what do they do then? What do you do once you are hired, once you are employed? You do two things. <laughs> Think and communicate, right? Yeah? <laughs> you, you perform and you learn. You learn. <coughs> you learn for the rest of your life. Yeah? When I tell you this, if I ask you, if I tell you, you will learn for the rest of your life, is that positive or negative? Positive. To whom is it positive? To whom is it negative? Okay. I mean, learn. I can tell, I can promise you that learning in practice is a different story than learning at the university. You know? uh, the traditional approach of learning in university is very much, you have to read a lot, you have to learn things by heart. You shouldn't do this in this course, I told you. I don't want you to learn things by heart, I want you to understand things. I want you to understand every single slide. Yeah? But I don't want you to repeat every single slide. That's a huge difference. Okay? You must be able to explain everything I've shown you, but I don't want you to learn things by heart. Learning things by heart is ridiculous, but you should understand these things. So, learning in university sometimes, yeah, unfortunately, is different from learning in practice. In practice, you still learn, yeah, you continuously learn. You still might read some things, you might attend some courses, but it's kind of different. And this is one of the greatest things of work, that you constantly learn. Okay? Now, companies really have, uh, they are interested in people constantly learning, because I've shown you, business is changing. Yeah? Do you remember my very first slide with the telephones? The old telephone, the first mobile, the iPhone, and then there was a question mark. And I told you, in 10 years from now, we will love about the iPhone. Oh, do you remember this old iPhone? <laughs> oh. This is not the end of the story. So the companies working in this business, and that's apply for every business. Yeah? The business will change. The technology will change. The products will change. And that means that people constantly have to learn. They have to adapt to new businesses. They have to adapt to new technologies, to new markets. So that's really key. Learning is a major factor for competitiveness of the companies. If people stop learning, yeah, uh, companies will fail. Definitely. So there are some things which I want to share with you. One thing is, what can we really learn through training? Training is one piece of learning. I want to highlight, what can we really learn through training? Yeah? Can we become more intelligent through learning, uh, through training? Can we become more talented through training? What do we gain through trainings? Yeah? Uh, where, where can we find trainings? How do company use, companies use training? How can we design, develop a training? Yeah? How can we define an environment where people really can learn, but most importantly, and this is the, the, the fourth question, it's a very important question, we'll discuss this. How can we ensure that what people learn in trainings is really transferred into practice? Yeah. Learning one thing in a course is one story, applying what you have learned at the workplace is a different story. How can we ensure the transfer from the learning environment into the working environment, okay? And then a bigger chapter will be things changed. We have internet, we have social media, uh, we have an environment now where people learn differently than 10 years ago, 20 years ago, okay? How do we use social media to learn? How do we use social networks to learn? How did things change? in a times where you have the entire knowledge of the world in your pocket. I mean, learning by heart made sense maybe 20 years ago because you, had, you have not had any access to, to any information. 
Now, with your smartphone in your bag, you have access to information every time, everywhere. It's ridiculous to learn things by heart because you have the information in your pocket. The question is how to use it, yeah? uh, how to benefit from it, how to, how to use your social networks to have the information you need at any point of time related to any kind of problems you deal with. So things change there, and I want, you, I want to share some ideas around this. This you can't find in modern, even in modern textbooks. Okay, this is really, really new. Okay. Now, what can we learn? What can you learn in a course like this? Can you learn knowledge? Hmm? Yes. You learn what is the difference between validity and reliability. Eh? What is an assessment center? What is the difference between stock option and stock ownership? Eh? What is the difference between a key function and a bottleneck function? Did we cover this? Yes. You, you acquire knowledge. At least you should be able to explain things. But this is just in your mind, and this is conceptual. This is theoretical. Okay? Having knowledge, does that necessarily mean <coughs> that you can solve problems? No. This comes from practice. This comes from reflecting on things. Right? Okay? But knowledge is a very important basis for competence. Competence means that you are able to solve problems. So knowledge is very much about theory, it's very much about what is between your ears. Yeah? You know something, yeah? but competence is about actually solving problems. Competence is related to action. It's behavioral. Okay? I can, I can read books about how to make a golf swing. And I can learn the 50 things you have to consider to do a right, perfect golf swing. I can learn all the 50 things which are relevant. Probably there are 100 things. All the 100 things which are relevant for doing a perfect golf swing, I can learn by heart. But actually doing a perfect golf swing. That's a totally different story. You can learn the rules of chess, schach, but actually playing chess, that's a different story. Okay? Knowledge, competence. What can I learn in a training? Primarily knowledge. Yeah? That's important. Also, if you have some uh, pra uh, uh, practical parts in the training, you also can acquire some, 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 some competence, but in a minor part. Now there comes a third um, concept into play named talent. What is a talent? We will talk about this in more detail when we talk about talent development, but this point of time, what is talent? Give me a name of a person, a person which we all know, who is talented. Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein <coughs> was talented. Who else? Tiger Woods. Tiger Woods. Yeah, we talk about both. <laughs> Tiger Woods. Let's stick to Tiger Woods. <clears throat> what is his talent? Playing God. When did he acquire this talent? When he was a boy of which age? Okay. Okay, now here comes the difference. At the age of probably two, at age of two he already had a perfect swing. Yeah, in the age of two, uh, his father probably, I, I'm not sure about this, but his father realized that this small boy has a talent. But when did Tiger Woods acquire this talent? When did this person got this talent? Huh? 
Probably when he was born, right? Probably when he's born, nine months before, at the point of, <laughs> at the point of conception. Yeah? When his DNA was defined. Okay? But at this point of time, when he was so tiny, he was not able to play golf, but he got the talent. Okay? This is the, at least this is the idea of talent. I know there's a lot of research around this, a different perspectives on this, but from my point of view, tal talent is something you are born with. And there is a, a concept which is very much related to this, it's potential. Talent, talent means you have the potential, not the competence, the potential to be incredibly good in something. Okay? And you got this through your DNA. Can you acquire talent through training? No, not at all. Talent must be identified, must be detected, and then it must be leveraged. Okay? Um, I was just wondering, you know how the speaker yesterday said that there's no such thing as talent because you just need 100 or 1,000, 10, 10,000 hours of practice? There's an author named Malcolm Gladwell. Mm -hmm. yeah, and he wrote a book, Outlier. And he showed that uh, people need... 10,000 hours to become incredibly good in something. And what were the examples in this book? The Beatles. They played 10,000 hours in Hamburg, yeah, in a small club, before they became famous. He looked at Bill Gates. Bill Gates did 10,000 hours of programming before he started building the operating systems for IBM. Uh, there is an example of a leading uh, a violin player. 10,000 hours of practice before this person became so. When we have all this example in this book, the critical point is, and this was missed by, by, by yeah. the speaker yesterday, mm -hmm. if you are not talented, probably you are not willing to spend 10,000 hours in doing something. We will learn that talent has to do something with fun. I love to do this. If you love to do something, you have the talent. Or if you have the talent, you love to do it. Okay? The Beatles would not have played for 10,000 hours if they would not have the talent. If you are not talented in something, you can spend 100,000 hours and you will not become a, an expert. That's the idea. Mm -hmm. So this idea of saying talent is crap, Bullshit. Absolutely. Yeah, I will show you. I will show you when it comes to talent development. Okay. Um, intelligence. Here we also talk about a so-called predisposition, disposition, a disposition. Something you um, also might be born with. Yeah. Intelligence is a good example, or or your physical strength. Yeah? We have people like this, and we have people like this. Yeah? If you are like this, you can do anything, you will not become like this. I mean, people are different. Yeah? They have different strength, different power. You are born with this. Can you change this to training? Maybe a little bit. Yeah? You can't get bigger, but you can get stronger. Yeah? But not significantly. So, uh, the only message here, and I will follow up on this, is that. Some things you can change through training. Some others must be developed through experience. Some things can't be changed at all. Okay, okay. so we will talk about training, the first step, and then we talk about experience. How can we ensure that people get the experience ready to learn? We start talking about training, and next time we talk about talent development, the second major part, okay? So, training. Training is a big business. Right? Uh, many companies have training departments, Personalentwicklung. What do they do? I have a picture here. Okay. Uh, I just want to, want to show you what is there, what, what, what companies really do in, in, in that field, in, in training. And I, 
uh, it helps is to, to, to categorize the different activities to a certain extent. And I would like to start on the right hand side, on the bottom right hand side. Here. Training for employees offered on demand at high volume. What is that? I have a picture here. In most companies, you will find, a, let's say, a catalog for different trainings. Okay? At least in bigger corporations. Uh, you want to improve your language skills? Okay, there is a course for it. Um, you want to learn how to use Excel or Word or PowerPoint? Okay, there is a course for it. You want to learn something about um, business administration, accounting, labor law? So, <clears throat> there are probably courses about this. Okay? So, the upper layer are about professional competencies. Right? And in the middle, you have courses very often about behavioral skills. Behavioral skills. Um, communication. How to lead people. Um, how to solve conflicts. How to manage conflicts. How to cope with, with stress. So how to manage yourself. Or how to do interviews in the recruiting process. See, these are very much behavioral courses. And on the bottom layer, you find typical trainings um, which are about methods, methods, techniques, which you can use in your daily work, like project management, <coughs> working techniques, yeah, uh, facilitation, presentation, time management, um, sales techniques. So uh, this just gives you a little bit an impression of the typical types of standard trainings companies offer. So, so this is uh, this field. You have this catalog, different trainings. They are offered. They are standardized. Every time the training happens in the same way. Uh, and these trainings are offered as long <coughs> as people ask for it. Yeah? Once there is nobody left who want to do an uh, office training, then you stop doing it. Uh, is this something for very, very big companies? Because from my experience when I was in London, as, right. a, as an HR trainee, I was supposed to find these trainings for the people. They had a list yeah, yeah. and everybody said what they wanted to do. If you, if you are in a small company, a mid-sized company, you have to buy these trainings. Right? Okay. Okay. So it's for like... It's for large, large companies. But even in large companies, these trainings mm -hmm. are not, not, not done by internals. These trainings are almost offered by, by external trainers, okay? Uh, so the people in HR, they, 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 they manage this. They, okay, which kind of training do you want to have? You make it possible, okay? Uh, but then, there are always groups of employees who want to have a special training. I think of, there is a training, t a sales team, right? A sales team and they want to improve their sales capabilities and they ask HR oh, can, can we do a sales training we have to improve our, our techniques on this okay let's customize one this is also on demand right this is training given because there are people in the company who want this training but it's special it's not standardized it's special it's customized for these particular needs okay but on the other side, on the left-hand side, we have so-called planned, strategically decided trainings. I give you some examples for the uh, for, for, for these types of trainings. Um, these are trainings which people which which are not demanded by people. These are trainings which you which you have to attend. Let's think of new hires and yeah, newly hired employees. In some companies, in the first week or two weeks, you have to do a training, onboarding. Yeah, we're going to talk about this in more detail. You have to do this. So, so when you start working with Google in Europe, you will spend two weeks or so in London. You have to. You have to go there learning about the Google's business, about the Google products, and about the way how Google employees work, right? If you start working with Accenture, this consulting firm, 
You probably will spend two weeks in Chicago. And you must learn the techniques of consulting. You learn the essential way of consulting. You have to do this. In some companies, if you, if you get promoted and you become a team lead, you have to do uh, management training. You have to. It's not that you think, oh, I have some knowledge gaps. So I, maybe I should do a training. Is there one? OK, there is one. I do it. No, you have to. Okay, it's not on demand, it's a must. It's planned, strategically decided. Okay. Then we have trainings on the uh, top left-hand side. Uh, in the next uh, semester, we will talk about change management. You know, maybe some of you have heard this term already. Change management, large-scale changes in a company. For instance, the implementation of a new IT system uh, or... Um, strategic change in the company. In the past we have produced this, now we produce this. Yeah? Whenever we have big changes in companies, people have to adapt their competencies. They have to change their skills. And for this we have training. So, for instance here, if a company implements SAP, people have, have to learn how to work with these systems. They have to. Okay. And the people attend this training not because they want to, but because they have to. Right? And um, it's unique. It, it's customized. It's just for this particular pers uh, purpose. You, you offer these trainings for maybe a uh, uh, half a year, and then it's done. Okay? So this gives you a little bit of an overview about the different types of trainings which we find in companies. Okay? Now, um, let's have a very concrete example. Okay? Um, let's talk about onboarding. What is that? Onboarding. Um, question to you. Uh, who of you has ever worked somewhere? As an intern or apprenticeship? Or, okay. How was the first day? Think about the very first day. When you drove to the company and enter the, the firm and meet the people. How was it? Um, well, <clears throat> with me it was like I didn't do many tasks. I just mm -hmm. learned the basics, like okay. the structure of the company, different okay. departments. How did you feel? Well, insecure, I guess. Okay, uncertain. Excited. Excited. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. And mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. It was weird situation. Weird situation. Yeah, sure. You don't know what to expect. So. Yeah, yeah. Other stories. Who raised his hand? Yeah. It was very odd to meet new people and new faces. Right. And I was not aware about my duties and responsibilities. Yeah. So I had to seek for help each and every time. Yeah. And I was trying to act um, at my best. Like yeah. And the good guy. It's <laughs> it's a very uncertain situation. Yeah. Yeah, you, you, you are the new guy. Yeah, you don't know nothing. You don't really know about your duties. You don't know about the culture. What is the kind of humor in this company? How do they dress? Yeah. Where's the coffee machine? Uh, who is who? Who is important? Who not? Um, how do we do things? You feel really uncertain. I mean, that's, that's really, that's a mess. The first few weeks in a company, it's always a mess. It's, it's a, the highest level of uncertainty. So this is a problem, really, because, uh, <clears throat> I mean, of course, you learn a lot, but, but, but you, as a company, you lose a lot of productivity if you not really professionally integrate the newly hired employees. Right? So, so there is an idea saying, um, if, if you don't do any onboarding activities, then productivity raises like this, slowly. At the beginning, you make a lot of mistakes. You, you are uncertain. You are not really productive because you don't really know how to do things in this particular company. Right? So. And there's the idea of, when we offer an onboarding training for the newly hired people, tell them how we work. Uh, help them to, to get to know some people. Uh, uh, help them to know that, to learn about the, the culture of the company and all these things, 
If you do this, you can increase the productivity in the first few weeks dramatically. Okay. So that's why, that's why many companies do this. They have really an onboarding program. And you're taken by the hand yeah, in advance to the first day. You already know the schedule of the very first days. You know, okay, in the very first day, there's a meeting for all new hired employees, and then there is this event, and then we do the course, and you have the schedule, and you feel secure. Yeah? You feel, okay, I have an idea of what's going to happen in the first few days, and they're going to help me. Okay. makes you feel good. It's also about reducing uncertainty emotionally. Okay. So, um, now, very concrete question. We have a company that hires, let's say, 50 people every year. Okay. 50 people every year. And um, HR got the feedback that um, there is a lot of uncertainty the newly hired employees and they request an onboarding program. They want, to, they want to have something like this because as far as today there is, there is nothing there. So your project is to develop an onboarding program. Yeah? A training which helps newly hired employees to get productive sooner. Okay. That's the idea. That would be a nice IP consulting project. Yeah. What would you do? Now think about it. Your task is to develop an onboarding program for a particular company. How would you develop this? You have half a year time to develop the training. How would you start? What would you do? Think about it. Isn't that difficult because um, we have to do it like a general onboarding program, right. but... For all people? Like, uh, for different all functions. Different functions, right. but we have to do that because... Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, then it's uh, maybe I will start with a company brand, company image, tell them what our general goal is, because that applies yeah. to everybody on the team. Mm -hmm. You saw, okay, the first step in the program is to tell the people about the culture, about the brand, and all these things. Okay. And they might have informed themselves, but maybe what, what's in the internet or the press is not exactly what our goal is because the image always is a bit different from what yeah. other people see. Yeah, yeah. So start with some general things. Right. Different ideas? Maybe also give them time so they can <coughs> get to know each other because I can imagine yeah. that mm -hmm. it's very difficult for them or if they have to think, okay, I don't know whether I would get to know people there because the social right. aspect is very right. important in the right. work life. Right. You, you, you encourage them to, to socialize, yeah? to build social networks, to, to have this uh, interpersonal exchange. Very good. Yeah? So these are already two ideas. Um, please. I, I mean, it's good. You, you already have ideas of what to do concretely. Yeah? But uh, please take one message home for, for the rest of your life. Whenever you start a project like this, it doesn't matter what kind of project it is. The first step is always what? It's an analysis. Yeah. Right? You thought about this. Right? It's like when you go to the doctor and say, I have some, some pain in my back. He will not come up with a solution. He will not say, oh, I have an idea. Let's do a surgery. No. The first thing you always do is you make an analysis. So. What does that mean, analysis, in this particular context? Yes, please. We uh, probably ask the latest uh, people that have started working there mm. what they would have wished to, to, to be okay. told. Or in order to understand what? Um, what their needs are. You want to understand the needs, right? You do a needs analysis first. This, is, this always applies when you want to, build, want to develop a training. So here is a, here is a very commonly used uh, concept, how to develop a training. And the first step is a needs analysis. You want to understand what are the needs of the newly hired people. You want to do sales training for the sales people. Okay, what are your needs? Yeah. You want to develop a management training for the team leads in the company, okay, what are their needs? Okay. 
Um, then the next step is, of mm. course, you design the program. And then you do it. Yeah, that's meant by operation. And then you evaluate it to understand, does it, does it run well? Do we need to adjust this to a certain extent? Uh, so this is a very typical um, approach to develop a training. And let's talk this through for a moment. And let's start with a needs analysis. Okay? Now, again, we want to build this onboarding program for new, newly hired people. I want to understand their needs. How would you do this? How do you analyze needs? I have. I think uh, I would go in two directions. First, I need to need that. I need to know what are the needs, not just of the new hired employees, but also of the management, and what is the production. Uh, the, productivity level that we need in the company and how is this going to work and then on the other hand I will see the new hired people who asked for the onboarding and what was their problems so I can yeah. fix them both together. Wonderful. Two perspectives. Yeah, You ask the managers what do you expect from the people in the future and maybe you ask them is there a gap between what you expect and what is there. Okay. You ask the managers and you talk with the newly hired people who requested this onboarding program. You want to have an onboarding program? Nice. Yeah. What do you need? Okay. <laughs> That's easy. Does that work? Mm. No. I have just one message here. If I ask you, if I ask you, uh, uh, I want to rebuild my HR course. What do you need? Please tell me, what do you need? What's the problem? What do you want to rebuild it for and how, like for what? what for what's, what? What's the goal? What's the goal? You okay. Want to for what? Okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think different people have different needs. So different people have different needs. Solution. Also people true. Yeah. Yeah. And I would need to know how did you do it before, so I need to have a deep look into your structure. Uh, as a new employee in a new company, that's yeah. hard to understand. Okay, okay. So, yeah? I guess if you don't know, if we don't know your expectations, we don't know what we need to know. You don't know my expectations? Yeah. So, uh, so yeah. <laughs> we don't know. Yeah. Uh, yeah? If we, if we tell you how to a course, we would need to know where, which, in which direction it is, it has to go, which goal. You tell me. But I don't know your education. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you see, how can we say? I mean, you are in the first semester. You have some idea about HR, but I mean, if you if you don't have a clue about HR, you can't tell me what you need. You know. If you if you ask somebody who knows nothing, and you ask, I don't tell you that you know nothing. Don't get me wrong. But if you ask somebody who knows nothing about something and ask him, what do you need to know in a state where he or she does not know nothing? It's hard to tell. If you if you don't know anything, you you, you hardly can tell what you need to know. Okay. Um, there is something which we call. A unconscious incompetence. Yeah, there is an incompetence I, I'm not conscious about. <laughs> I mean, if you would know what you don't know, you would feel incredibly depressed. <laughs> really? If you would know what you don't know, you, you, yeah. I mean, you even don't know what you know. You know a lot. But you don't know. That's a different problem. <laughs> okay? But you don't know what you don't know. You have to reach a certain level of competence to, to understand what you did not know in the past. But from where you are currently, you can't tell what your needs are. Right? So, so if, you, if you grow further, if you, if you learn, you, you, you might gain a, 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 known, a known incompetence. You know that you have incompetence in something. Yeah? 
But even then, if you grow further, you come to a stage where you have an implicit competence. You, you, you know something, but you don't know what you know. I, I would like to give you an example. Who, who of you is able to drive a car? How do you do this? Please tell me. Come on. How do you start a car? Come on. Uh, yeah? I turn on the keys. Okay, what then? Then I press the... What, what? What press you? What do you press? Uh, I don't know what it means. You don't know? Yeah. Okay. And then I press the gas. Okay, and then? <laughs> and then I drive backwards or forwards. Okay. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. Yep. You had to think, right? You had to think. We know how to drive a car. And if you ask how you do this, you think, what the hell do I do? I, I must think. I must observe myself while I'm doing this automatically. Yeah? Whom of you is uh, playing an instrument? What do you play? Piano. Piano. And you play some, can, can you play from the heart? From what? What do you mean? Uh, without notes? Certain, yeah, certain songs, Something? yeah. Asking, how did you do this? And you have to play, play this slowly. Uh, it's incredibly uh, difficult. Right? You, you know so many things, but once you are asked, how do you do this? You can't tell. It's implicit knowledge. So even in a, in, in a needs analysis, if you, if you ask people who are highly competent, how do you do this? They can't tell you. They can't tell you. Okay? Uh, so, so to make the long story short, just to ask people, what is your needs? Or just to ask competent people, what do, you, what do we need to be competent? It's, 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 ve it's very difficult. It's very difficult. You also ask the bosses what the, the problems of the first hey. weeks are. Yes, the boss is about real problems. Where did the people fail? What were critical incidents? Yeah, here, is, uh, here are some, some ideas. Yeah? Uh, here on the top right-hand side, critical incident technique. We already talked about this. What were situations of the newly hired people where they really struggled? And then the people tell you, well, I don't know what I need, but there was a situation where I was asked to prepare something and I did not know how to do this. But this was critical. Yeah? I was over-challenged. And you, you, you cannot tell what this person needs, but, but you know that there is a critical situation where the people uh, tend to fail. Okay? Uh, of course, you can do structured interviews with individuals, uh, but again, that's, 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 not, that's uh, kind of difficult. You can have some tests, tools maybe. Uh, you can talk with the peers. Yeah, the colleagues of the newly hired people, what do you think, where should the people get better, where did they fail, what did they do mistakes, and all these things. But what, what I especially like is shadowing, or diaries. You, know, you ask the newly hired people to, to, to make a diary, a blog, about their, about their first few days, and talk about the situations where they struggle. Right? Or shadowing, shadowing means you just, you just follow the people through the day. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. Bothering them, no, okay. coaching. Yeah, you take ten newly hired people, and at the end of each day, you talk the day through in a round. Okay, let's talk about the day. How was it? Was it good? No. What was critical? Where did you have a problem? And just, just collect the different things, just to understand where are the needs. Okay. You can observe people maybe <laughs> in an off-site needs assessment workshop. You just have a workshop with the newly hired people and talk about these things. So the main message here, it's not just interviewing. There are some other methods really just to, to understand the needs of the specific target groups. Okay? Then, once you have understood the needs, you have a list of needs. These are the top seven needs. These are the things we really want to bring across in the onboarding training. 
Then the next question is how to do this. Yeah. When we think about a training activity, what do you think of? What is that? What is a training? How does it look like? What happens in a training? What, what comes to your mind? Sitting in the first row. <laughs> <laughs> um, a certain group of people yeah. who need extra skills. Group of people sitting somewhere yeah, in a hotel. In a different room or a hotel. Yeah. Conductor yeah. doing something. And a trainer teaching them. Well, there's a trainer <laughs> yeah. teaching them. Right. This is our this is our idea of training, right? Something what we do currently. <laughs> yeah. There's a trainer. It's a group of people. The trainer tell the people how to do things. That's training. Okay. Uh, let's be careful. There are totally different types of trainings. So when we talk about the design of a training, I want you to see that there is a huge variety of things which which can be done. And a first differentiation which you really should know is a key term in HR is that. There are on-the-job trainings and off-the-job trainings. On this picture, you will find different approaches, but the most important ones, the most important terms, which are also used in practice heavily, are on-the-job training and off-the-job training. You know what that is. Yeah? On-the-job is you are at your natural workplace right? in the company, and uh, you learn things through a conductor, through a trainer. And it's very close to what you really do. It's really close to your duties and responsibilities. Okay, while off the job training, this is rather what we think of when we think of training. Yeah? People attend the training somewhere in the Black Forest, in a in a in a hotel, sitting in a room for two days learning something off site. So they are away from their natural workplace. Okay? What is better? On the job. On the job. Sure. Because why? Because at the same time you're going to have experience. You're doing the very thing, yeah. not only listening, but also practicing. Yeah. You learn something and you immediately apply it. Okay, okay wonderful. Do you have an uh, example in your mind? Like we did the team building, that's probably yeah. better outdoor training. Good point, good point. It depends on the, on, the, on, the, on the needs you want to address, right? You did the team, team building training? Ah, you hardly do a team building training at the workplace, yeah. right? You have to go off. Right? So, uh, since there are both there, since there is on-the-job training and off-the-job training, uh, the answer must be, okay, depends. Both are right, but for different purposes. Let's have a look at the two different things. Uh, and here is an overview about the advantages. Let's talk about this for some minutes. On-the-job, clear. It's very job-related. Yeah, it's very close to what you do. And, and once things are very close to what you do, you can immediately apply it. Yeah. And you don't need any training facility. You have no travel costs. Yeah. And for this, you don't have an extra trainer, maybe. There are your colleagues, maybe your boss or whoever who, 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 uh, who helps you. Um, you can immediately apply what you have learned. So the, the learning transfer, learning transfer, important concept, we we'll talk about it later. The transfer of what you know into your work is much better when things are very close to your natural uh, duties and responsibilities. You do something, you get an immediate feedback. Yeah. Because it's, it's, it's so close to what you, what you do. Okay? you see your progress and, and probably you know, the, the motivation to learn is much higher because, because the things you learn are very relevant to what you do. You have a problem. You have to solve something. You need some knowledge now to solve this problem and you acquire this knowledge just to solve this problem and, and then things become very relevant to you 
and relevance always lead to a higher motivation to learn. Right? So, so there are good reasons why to do on-the-job training. But after job, um, you probably have a trainer who is a professional trainer. It's not your colleague, it's not your boss, it's a professional trainer. You want to learn a knowledge, you want to, you want to, uh, you want to learn project management techniques, you want to learn sales techniques. Yeah? It's a good idea to have a professional trainer, a champion of this. Yeah? And you hardly have such a, a champion at your workplace. Yeah? You rather have it on a two-day training somewhere off. Right. <coughs> you have a professional learning environment, maybe. So, um, let's have an example. If you, if you, if you drive to Darmstadt, Darmstadt, no? It's the direction of Frankfurt. And you are at Seeheim Jugendheim, yeah? where the traffic jam always is. Mm -hmm. And you, you leave the, the, the highway, you drive to right side into the Odenwald, through the woods. <laughs> Now, what, where will you end up? Uh, What's there? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, uh, what I think about is there is a huge facility somewhere in the midst of the woods of Lufthansa. Right? Yeah. A huge facility. And this facility is there to, to train the flight attendants pilots, it's, it's huge. Some people spend their weeks yeah, to learn some competencies. It's really a place which is only there to learn. This is off the job, really. It's not in the plane, it's in the woods. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and they, of course, they have professional uh, uh, facilities, simulators, uh, they have they have classrooms with Beamer, <laughs> yeah. Um, they have places where you really can relax, uh, where you where you can discuss, where you can socialize in the evening, yeah. Uh, a very famous example is Crottonville General Electric. It's a place for leaders, yeah. Le for their leadership development programs, they have a place. It's a wonderful place for their leaders. It's really inspiring. They spend time there, they discuss there, they work together there. Uh, I was in the Leadership Development Center uh, of, of IBM near New York. Wonderful, wonderful. It's really a place to learn and to think and to share inspirations and all this stuff. So, so to have this environment, it's very important to learn because in your natural workplace, you have a lot of disturbance. You always deal with different things. And you don't have this professional environment really to learn. So, so it's important to have this special environment. And you really can focus on the training. Yeah. You are there two days just to learn. And there is nothing else, no meetings, no calls, nothing. Okay? And then, of course, uh, the last point. What do employees do when they are on a three-day training. What do they do in the evening? They share their information. They share information. They socialize. They talk to each other. Socialize. They drink. <laughs> they drink like hell, right? Uh, officially, we name this uh, socializing. Uh, we name this uh, get-together. So, ladies and gentlemen, after the session today, I would like to invite you to all get together. <laughs> is that okay? Yes, it's okay. No, I don't think drinking is okay. Uh, I don't drink. But um, have people together in the evening, sitting together, having a beer. What do they do when they do this? They work. They exchange things. They, they, they network. They build relations which can be beneficial for their careers. Okay? And this rather happens on this off-the-job training. So, in sum, 
you see that uh, there are very different approaches and we, we can't say which is better. Okay? I want you to understand that there is on-the-job training and off-the-job training, there's a difference and there are advantages for both sides. Okay? What, what to do in the training, that's the other question. Okay? And uh, I have just collected here some, some methods. I, I, I mean, you, you know these methods. Um, of course, we have methods which you can use on an individual level or on a group level. Yeah? And some things are very standardized and other are rather dynamic. And the most individual, most standardized approach to learn is to what? To read a book. <laughs> the book doesn't change. It's not dynamic at all. It's static. And you read it. You only can read a book by your own, not in a group. <laughs> While to the other extreme, a role play, yeah, where you have to maybe solve a conflict in a group. It's very open, unstructured, dynamic. You only can do this in a group. You cannot do a conflict management exercise alone. <laughs> you should do this in a group. Of course, we have things like doing a presentation. You know what a business simulation... Did you do this? Business simulation? Business game? Yeah? yeah? Okay. So that's, that's coaching. Coaching. We can talk about coaching in the next session. Very important. Very dynamic. But in most cases on, on an individual level. Okay? I mean, you have an idea about these different things. Uh, one term you should take home because it's important and it's not so commonly used. In practice it is commonly used, but maybe you haven't heard this so far. It's the term blended learning. Blended learning. What is that? Blended learning means we have a combination of these different learning techniques. Okay. Uh, Here is a very typical training schedule. Uh, nothing you should learn by heart. <laughs> it's just, just a typical example. If you, if you prepare a training in a professional way, you have something like this. Very clearly structured. What is the objective of the different units? What is the material we use? What is, what is, what is the content? Uh, and, and, and so on. Okay? Um, last thing before we do a, a short break. The last phase of the approach which I have shown is the evaluation of a training. Evaluation. At the end you want to know, okay, we have now this onboarding program, uh, we did this for half a year, and now we want to know, does it really work? Is it good? Or should we adjust it to a certain extent? And here, evaluation comes into play. And there is a very well-known concept of a guy named Kirkpatrick. Uh, he says uh, there are four different levels how to evaluate a trainer. And um, you all know these levels more or less, at least the top ones. The first level is just to look at the reaction of the attendants. Uh, the reaction. Um, you ask the people, did you like the training? We have a questionnaire. Did you like the structure, the material? You know, we also do this in our lectures. Right? This is just looking at the reaction. That hel that's, uh, that's helpful. That gives you a kind of indication whether the training was okay, at least from your perspective. Okay? It's cheap. Yeah? What's the problem? What's the problem with this kind of training evaluation? Subjective. It's very subjective. What else? Again, the people who don't know, don't know, <laughs> yeah. they are judging. Yeah, yeah. Uh, did I really learn something? Right? Did I learn something? Yes, I liked the training. I didn't learn anything. <laughs> but it was funny. Good trainer, good material, good structure. Yeah? So the problem of each level is that you miss the next level. Okay? You can really influence the people as a trainer. In some companies, uh, your fee, 
that you get at the trainer depends on the reaction of the pupil. Uh, and if you are an experienced trainer, you know how to, 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 to impact the people. Yeah. You have a five-day training, and it's Friday. And on Thursday evening, get-together, you know, heavy get-together. The attendants want to go home. They're tired. As a trainer, you say, uh, uh, before the lunch, you know, guys, you did so well. We worked so fast. We can finish the training after lunch. You can go home. Yeah. Yes, wonderful. Ah. Yeah. But one last request, please. Here is a questionnaire. Can you please fill out this questionnaire? Yeah. The people fill out the questionnaire. Yeah, I can go home. No traffic jam. I see my family. Ah, super training. Ah. Yeah. It works. It always works. You can you can impact the people. Of course, it's, it's, it's easy, right? So, but the most important problem is that you do not really know whether the people learn something. That's why we do tests yeah, after this course. I mean, we could say, if you like this lecture, then it's fine. No, it's not. <laughs> it's nice if you like the lecture, but the important point is, did you learn something? And you can, you can tell this by doing a test, kind of examination, you know this. But even though, if you learn something, in practice the question is, do you really change your behavior? Now let's have a very concrete example. You have a sales training, you have your training for salespeople, and you tell the people how to do presentations. A tr a traditional presentation training. Right? And, um, okay, the people liked it, check. The people learned the seven rules of good presentations. Check. Learned something. But that's not enough. Do they really change their behavior once they present in front of people? So that's the important point. Do they really transfer what they have learned into practice? That's on this level. And you see, this is much harder to be done than just looking at the reaction. You have to do some observation. Maybe the peers, the manager, have to evaluate how you change your behavior. But even then, if the salespeople change their behavior and they apply the seven rules of presentations, and it's not enough. As a company, what do I want to achieve with the salespeople? Is it that I want, to do, want, want, want them to do good presentations? Is that what I want to expect as a company? No. What, what do I expect? I want them to be successful. I want them to, to be successful. My profit. Right. They should increase revenue. So this is what I'm interested in. Does the, tra that, does the training really improve revenue? So, and this is about the results. And you know, this is now very, very difficult, but, but reasonable. If companies find ways to really look at this level, then it's the highest level uh, of training evaluation. There is, there is one key challenge with training. One key challenge, which is what we name the learning transfer. 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 What does that mean? The question is, when people learn something in a training and they get back to their workplace, do they really apply what they have learned? Yeah. And that, that's crucial. And training only pays off if people apply what they have learned. It's that simple. So learning transfer is a, is a crucial point. Now a question to you. What improves learning transfer? I mean, let's think about this training A. People learn something in the training and they do not apply anything in their real workplace. Training B, they learn also something and they fully apply it. What's the difference between A and B? We have the possibility to apply it in their workplace. For example, if you learn a special method like using a program, you also have to give them the possibility to employ this knowledge right. later on so. because otherwise they will forget it. They have the possibility to apply this. It's simple. You simply have the possibility to do this. Right? What else? A 
I think it also depends on the personality. Maybe some people don't want to change. Some people don't want to change. No, they attend the training, everything's fine. Blah, blah, blah. And then they go back and uh, continue in the same old way. Because they don't change. People don't want to change. They feel comfortable with their, own ha- with their old habits. Yeah? And also, if I wouldn't see any benefits out of it, yeah. I wouldn't apply it, I guess. Yeah. I wouldn't be yeah. motivated. Yeah, if I don't see any benefit. If, 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 if the training content does not make my life easier, why should I apply it? Very simple ideas. Um, this is about knowledge, uh, uh, learning transfer. So, and there was some research, and <coughs> one of the most important <coughs> studies is summarized here. Yeah. What are the factors to really ensure learning transfer? And most things on this picture are obvious. Yeah, of course, it has to do with the participant. Mm-hmm. If they are not smart enough, if they don't have the cognitive abilities to follow the content, then they will not apply the content, of course. If they're not motivated, of course, they will not apply it. If they're not ready to learn, if they resist to the content, they will not apply it. Okay? I mean, that's easy. Also, it has to do with the training. As such, the training quality, does it really address... Does it really address the critical needs? Yeah? Is the trainer right? The media, the structure, the methods, the material, the environment, all these things, of course. Um, and then the work environment. What you spoke about, the, the, the opportunity to apply, it's, it's absolutely uh, critical. Do the colleagues, the managers support that you apply what you have learned? Do they request this new behavior? Do they appreciate the new behavior? Yeah? Um, one point which I want to highlight here is um, I mean there might be two types of participants two types and this is depends on the participant the training and the environment all in once type number one are employees who attend the training with a mindset okay I go there let's see what I get It's nice to have two or three days off in the Black Forest, nice hotel, nice colleagues. Let's see. Maybe I'll learn something. If not, it's a pity. But I get a big binder. That's nice. Okay, maybe there is some benefit, maybe not. Let's see. Okay? These are the so-called training tourists. Okay? Employee number two, it's an employee saying, I have a problem. I have to manage a project. And the project is complicated. I have to manage a project team. I have to plan the project. But I don't know how to do this. I have some ideas, but I don't feel really comfortable. I have to learn techniques, how to lead people, how to plan projects, how to control projects. I. I, I need to know this knowledge, otherwise I will fail, and I don't want to fail. So I have some very concrete questions in my mind, some concrete issues, some concrete challenges. And with these challenges and my questions, I go to this training, I attend the t- two three days, and I learn project management. When I leave the training, what do I have in my bag? Just some learnings? No. What I have in my bag is answers, a solution. And that's the difference. Do people take home something or do they take home solutions? And that's that's a major difference. And this has to do with the participant. This has to do with the training. It also has to do with the environment in which the employees work. I just want you to see this, this difference. Okay? Now... Excuse me, sir. Does the second type have a name as well, like the training tourist? No. Oh. <laughs> Does the second type of employee also have a name? I don't know. <laughs> we have to invent one. Okay. So, um, in the last few minutes, I, I would like to, half an hour, <laughs> so, I would like to highlight uh, a very new field. Yeah. Learning in companies did change 
in the last few years, dramatically. The way you learn is different from how your parents did learn, or probably. And the way you acquire knowledge as an employee is different from how your parents did acquire their knowledge. Why? Because the environment did change. We have internet, we have social media. I want to talk about this because it's very crucial. Many things changed in that field. And before we talk about this, I would like to, to uh, introduce a, a concept which is quite old. It's the concept of informal learning. That's, that's very important. What is that? Um, informal learning. Um, question to you. Just think about it. Is there something you can do better than most other people? Is there an, I don't, don't want to ask you personally. Just think about it. Is there something which you can do <coughs> better than most other people? Okay? Question number two. How did you learn this? I would like to see the answer. How? How did you learn this? Basically practice and also practice. you have to be motivated because mm -hmm. if it doesn't make sense to you... You wanted to learn it. I wanted to. Through experience? Through experience. Mm -hmm. What experience? Um, if something didn't work out, I knew what I had to do differently in the next time. Okay. Yep. You know what the honest quest, uh, answer is? Of course, experience, of course, of course, motivation. You don't know. Yeah. Okay, it's practice, it's feedback, and, and maybe instruction. But if you really think about how you learn things, you just did it. And you got better. Huh? You did mistakes, which you didn't want to do. So you tried to avoid these, and you adjusted your behavior. How? Ah, you don't know. Sometimes you know, sometimes you don't. If you ask people in companies, what can you do incredibly well, and how did you learn this? They tell you, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I learned things somehow, on the run. And this is what we name informal learning. Learning that just happens. Right? Uh, while formal learning... Formal learning is learning that takes place in a situation, in an environment that is dedicated to learning. For instance, a training. A training is a place where you learn. Okay? You go there, you get some instruction, you get some material, some exercises, you learn, you go home, you learn something. While learning as a, let's say, side effect of work yeah, and you constantly, you learn every day, but you, you are not even not conscious about what you learn every day. Yeah? This learning, this is named informal learning. And uh, what is the message here? The message is that we know that people primarily learn informally. Yeah? While the budgets which we have in companies for training, yeah, uh, has an effect only for 20% of the learning. How big is the budget for training? Do we know this? If operating costs of a company are, let's say, 100 million. 100 million? That's a mid-sized company of, let's say, 1,000 employees or more. And you have 100 million operating costs. How big is the budget for training? What would you guess? Half percent? Point three percent? Yeah? If you have 100 million operating costs, maybe on average, the budget for training is 300,000. Half million. And this is there only for 20% of the learning. All the rest, the learning, happens somehow. And what I want you to do is to think about how do we learn somehow? And it's, 
Is there, is there a way to improve the, the somehow learning? Yeah. Can we as a company shape an environment that encourage people to somehow learn, to more learn informally? That's, 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 that's the point for the remaining uh, part of the session. Okay? And before we talk about this, I would like to show you something. And, and this is the only slide I want you to learn by heart. Of all the ones we, we, we looked at. So Please draw this picture. Yeah, you can start just looking at the small T's and count them, and then you will. No, just kidding. What is that? Um, I, I would like to put something into extreme. On the left side, we see the old traditional world. On the right side, we see, we see uh, uh, the present. In the past, a company typically was like this. You had a boss. That's the red T. The boss had a huge general knowledge. Yeah? Okay? Huge general knowledge and much expertise. Okay. So the horizontal bar is the general knowledge and the vertical bar is the expertise. And the boss knew everything. Yeah. He was the guru. He was the natural trainer of the people. He told the people how to do things. Uh, and, and the employees, the creatives, they were just like the boss, just a little bit smaller. Also a little bit general knowledge and some expertise. Everybody has expertise in his or her field. Okay? That was the past. Now we are on the right side. What's the difference? Uh, I told you, in your career, what will you do? You will do two different things. You will think and you will communicate. You will become an expert in your field doesn't matter what you're going to do. You will work with your brain. You're going to be an expert in something. Right? And uh, this applies for, for most fields in industry. Uh, look at software development. Each software, developer, each software developer who has some experience is an expert in his or her field. And most software developers know much more about their subject about their, their work than their immediate manager. Yeah. You follow? Okay. <coughs> Things became so complicated these days, the projects become so complex, that a manager dealing with a group of people can't know everything. Yeah? They have people who are experts in different fields, and they know a lot. And though they know much more than their manager. It's a little bit like in universities. Yeah? Who is my boss? I don't know. Maybe the president? Maybe. Who knows more about HR? The president? Mr. Schofer? Or me? Hopefully me. <laughs> yeah. Who knows more about marketing strategy? Mr. Schofer? Our president? Or Professor Mergard, hopefully Professor Mergard. So, in a setting like this in a university, each professor has more knowledge in his or her field than their boss. So it's more on the right side. It's like an orchestra, where the conductor, yeah, the dirigent, uh, has some general knowledge, but each and every person in the orchestra is better in playing the instrument than the conductor can do. Okay. So this is the situation today, where managers are surrounded by experts. Now, from whom do experts learn? From their boss? Probably not. From whom do they learn? From each other. From each other. They learn from each other. That's why a term uh, is so important this day. Uh, we name it social learning or peer learning, learning from each other. And we know that this is so crucial. People primarily learn from each other. And this is a difference than learning from the boss. That's a difference from learning from a professional conductor. They learn from each other. And to put it more complicated, 
here is a picture that shows the, the full, I name it, learning environment uh, of people in modern companies. Yeah, I say in modern companies. Question to you. Um, you prepare yourself for the exam in HR. Yeah? And there is something which you haven't understood. When you think, uh, what did Strauss say about this? I can't remember. I didn't get it. What is reliability? Damn, I can't remember. What do you do? Google it. You watch Google it. Huh? Or watch your video. Watch my video. You Google it. Maybe you have a book. Sir? Yes, someone. Hey, uh, does everybody does anybody know about reliability? Yes, me. Okay, please tell me. Um, this is what's shown here. Uh, this guy has a problem. He wants to know something about labor law, about Excel, about project management. Doesn't matter what. So, in the past, he went to his direct manager. He's still there, but less relevant. Okay, you can talk to peers, the colleagues. Maybe you can do an off-the-job training, as we just uh, discussed. Um, maybe he, he is in a community of practice. We'll talk about this later. It's, it's a group of people who share the same interest, who share the same expertise, and they meet to exchange their knowledge. Right? Okay. But then we see that this person can um, use very different sources this person can take some literature. It's also the traditional stuff. The person can go to a conference, Excel conference, <laughs> project management conference, conference about something in HR, about labor law, whatever. Uh, but now we find a lot of sources which are new. New in terms that they didn't exist five years ago, or at least ten years ago. Uh, you can go to YouTube. If you want to learn how to do, use pivot tables in Excel, use YouTube. Yeah? Here. In YouTube you find a lot of tutorials. You find tutorials about everything. So, I always say, YouTube is the biggest learning platform in the world. Some of you might think of YouTube, yes, that's a funny place to find funny videos. That's true, but it's also the biggest learning platform in the world because you will find tutorials about everything. How to play Stairway to Heaven on the guitar. Around golf you find millions of tutorials about everything, about Excel, everything, okay? Of course, wikis, and do not only think about Wikipedia. There are a lot of other wikis out there, blogs. Yeah, people share their knowledge there somewhere. You have expert forums. You can, you, can, uh, you can meet people in certain forums where they exchange knowledge about everything, about law, about technique, about, 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 about everything. Yeah? In the private sphere or in the professional sphere. Or maybe you have a network at Xing or LinkedIn and you're organized in certain groups where you just can post a question. Yeah, and you get some feedback from the others. Okay, this is new. Or podcasts. Um, podcast. You know what a podcast is? Hmm? Podcast only o o audio. Okay, you just can listen. You can download podcasts on different <laughs> places. Maybe through iTunes. Yeah, uh, from different business schools, they offer podcasts. So uh, to me, it's a very important source. I learn through podcasts. When I drive my car, I don't read books. Yeah? I shouldn't do so. <laughs> but I can listen. I can listen to podcasts. Ten minutes about something. Now I can learn something. Okay? Podcasts, very important. Uh, Twitter, for instance. Yeah? So, uh, or iTunes U. This session is recorded and will be made available on iTunes U. Okay? So, the message here is that um, when you look at training in a traditional HR textbook, you will learn something about 
this traditional training stuff. Yeah? But this is reality. Yeah? Since five or ten years, we have this environment where people really can access a universe of, of knowledge and experts. Okay? And uh, we have a name for this. We have a name for this. We name this Learning 2.0. Learning 2.0. Yeah? And I would like to uh, summarize this. Learning 2.0 which is the modern form of informal learning. Uh, some principles before we talk about this. Here's the question. Yeah, about the reliability of sources you mentioned, like YouTube and then uh, and all. Sure. And the reliability of the sources. Like uh, you said that they are the users in the content, so maybe they are not as much reliable as the uh, literature and stuff. So the special thing about learning 2.0, that's the point, is 2.0. What does that mean, Web 2.0? What is Web 2.0? User-generated user -generated content. The users generate the content. And whenever users generate content and make content available, then the question comes up, is that reliable? Yeah, that's a, that's a very important question. And uh, how is it? Can we rely on things which are posted on Wik Wikipedia? Sometimes. Yeah. How, how, how does it happen that when the quality of Wikipedia is not so bad? Because everybody can write. Uh, everybody can write. Yeah. There, somebody will make sure that it is correct. They don't get posted immediately. Yeah, there's a kind of still. social control. Yeah. And you have to have explicit sources, and they're always on the bottom, so you can also okay. check it yourself. And others will do that too. And if you change uh -huh. something in an article that is quite popular, yeah. and after that yeah. change is made, it's not directly put online, but somebody will double check what you wrote. Right. And if right. it's unnecessary. Yeah. So there is a social control. Yeah. yeah. If you, I mean, do the check. I did it in, a, in another lecture. I changed something in Wikipedia. We went on the page of Schwenningen, and in the lecture I wrote onto the page, I can do it. Hmm? Schwenningen is the nicest city in the world. And it's there. How long? You can change it. You can change Wikipedia. It's, it's, it's easy. You can do it. <coughs> Somebody else will enter this page sometimes and see, oh, that's crap. And he will change it. So things which are not reliable might be changed by others. So that, that's, that's the idea of, of learning 2.0, that that the quality comes in through the social control. Okay? Now, <coughs> let me summarize. What we have today, number one, is it became very, very easy for everybody to produce learning content and to make learning content available. Okay? This is principle number one. Every one of you can make a YouTube video in a minute and you can share it on YouTube. Okay. So, I mean, that's new. It's new that people just, just post their knowledge somewhere and make it available to others. That's a new quality. Okay? It's, no more, it's no more a privilege of authors, professors, certain teachers. It's the opportunity of everybody who has internet access to provide knowledge. It became easy to produce videos became easy to produce podcasts. Everybody can publish things. Okay? The second principle is of more importance. This is about learning on demand. What we did in the past was learning just in case. Like learning just in case meant you learn something just on deposit to if it comes to the situation that you need this knowledge, you have it available. That's why we learn things by heart. Now, it, it became totally irrelevant. You don't need to learn things by heart because you have the entire knowledge in your pocket. Right? So you have access to a universe of knowledge and experts. You don't need to learn things by heart. You don't have to learn just in case. 
learn on demand. Learn on demand means now I have a problem. I have to use pivot tables in Excel. I don't know how to do it. Okay. I look at YouTube. I look at some sources and I learn it in a situation where I need the knowledge. That's learning on demand. Easy. Hmm? And what we also spoke about is social learning, learning from peers. It's not only learning via social media from others, but also learning in groups, learning from your colleagues, learning from peers. That became very, very relevant. And the last principle is, uh, you might be surprised about the last one, it's about that people need room and infrastructure to, to, to work in this learning environment. In some companies, and I don't know how, how many companies, but in some companies, the employees are not allowed to use the internet. Yeah. Or at least YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. The company says, you are here to, to work and not to surf in the internet. Yeah. Does that make sense? It's a very narrow-minded approach because you can very use Twitter to uh, generate even more revenue, actually. If you so that's it. About your new product. You can use Twitter, you can use LinkedIn, you can even use Facebook to learn. Yeah. And it's a very, very you said it right. Uh, it's a very narrow-minded uh, perspective. Um, it's as I would say, people don't need telephone to work, because they should not telephone; they should work. Hey, sorry, work means communication, and for this, I need a phone. It's like the internet. Yeah, you say well. Uh, people should not use YouTube, people should not use Twitter, people should not use LinkedIn. That's crappy. Somebody who says this uh, did not understand anything about the new way of learning. If you can't use Google at your workplace, yeah, you are, you are, you don't get the access to this universe of knowledge which you might need in your workplace. You don't have the access to the network which you need uh, to do the work well. So, that's uh, is why I, I, I sometimes get the response of managers saying, Professor Torres, that's all nice with these new learning things, uh, but I want people to work, not to spend time in YouTube. Probably these guys are wrong. Okay? And that's why the fourth principle is about people in companies should be responsible for the way they learn. Yeah? And you should rely on the people saying, well, you have to do your work, you have your objective. If the internet is beneficial for you, please use it. You are an adult. Uh, okay? So uh, I rely that you are mature enough to use the internet in a reasonable way.